Welcome back to another weekly GMBN Tech Show. Coming up on this week's show, we check out some futuristic saddle tech from Specialized. Uh, Trust Performance, those guys that make the crazy carbon fiber trailing link fork are back with another longer travel fork. Uh, we also check out some really cool retro gold from you guys. Okay, so let's jump straight into news. And the first thing this week in news is the brand new fork from Trust Performance. Now they became quite famous with their very unique looking fork. Uh, some likened it to a bit to a praying mantis. Uh, it's a trailing link design, so it's not a telescopic fork, it's a linkage based fork with a slightly rearward axle path on it as well. Um, totally unique in its design and created by some industry veterans. So this is the new fork on screen right now. Uh, this, the fork is called the Shout and it's the bigger brother to the previous fork which was known as the Message. Now at a glance you can tell the difference between the two because the Message has a slightly straighter um, main leg on it whereas you can see there's a slight curve towards that first main pivot on the new longer travel Shout. So the previous fork had 130 millimeters of travel. This one now has 178 millimeters of travel. You can use this on both 27 and half and 29 inch wheels. And because of its unique design, it actually can be used in the place of various travel forks. And the reason for that we'll get to in a minute, but on a 29 inch wheel bike, it will replace anything between 160 and 180 mil and on the 27 half between 160 and 170 mil. It doesn't work like a traditional telescopic fork. In fact, it doesn't work anything like a traditional telescopic fork. Um, I'm, yet, I'm yet to actually sling a leg over one and try one myself, but I will be riding one soon. So I will sort of let you know um, my thoughts on how it actually handles out on the trail. But part of the feeling that this fork has, uh, here's some details just in the meantime while I'm waffling on, have a look at this linkage on there. So these are the words from the guys over there. So you say the contoured wheel path lessens the feel of head angle change, axle to crown height and fixed offset, which means it's capable of replacing a wide range of telescopic axle to crown heights. So the axle to crown height on this one is 580 millimeters. Um, just so you know, a 27 and a half inch wheel 180 mil travel Lyric uh, is 572. So to give you a, a little ballpark idea there. Um, so basically as the fork dives, the mechanical trail actually increases rather than decreases, which is what happens with a telescopic fork. So that's where your head angle changes that dramatically. Now you'll obviously notice that more, it's going to be more accentuated on a hardtail for example, but the fact is your, your steering geometry changes constantly on a telescopic fork and they've basically designed this fork around trying to resist that, trying to do the complete opposite. So in theory, the harder you push this fork, the more stable it gets, not the less stable uh, handling results you will have from that. Um, so a completely bizarre way of working and I've heard from various people that have ridden this fork, friends of mine, that you have to totally rethink the way you ride. Uh, and they all swear that it's a very impressive thing, although I'm sure it's not for everyone. So what you can see on your screen is the top of the damper leg there, and you can see a, a little lever there, quite, quite similar to many on suspension forks with a three position. So it's more like open, mid and closed. Now the thing that's really unique about these is it's a three shaft twin tube damper and as far as I know, it's an industry first as well. So the fully locked out position, so the closed position, actually does this from 20% sag. So if you were to turn on that lever on any other normal fork, let's just say a Fox 34, as you turn it on, you get on the bike, it's not going to move, it's not going to sag. This one will still sag to the correct sag point, then it's going to be stiff. So actually your ride height is where it should be when the fork is locked. So that's a really interesting concept. Um, dead keen to find out what that actually feels like. Um, they weigh 2,170 grams. They've got a whopping 250 hour service interval on them. Not like telescopic forks, which tends to have like 50 hours just supposed to do like um, low leg servicing, uh, sometimes even replace the seals. At the very least, you want to be replacing the wiper seals and there, the oil, the lower leg oil and the crush washers on the bottom. So 250 service hours there. Uh, they're also not subject to the same kind of issues that you can get with telescopic forks, i.e. all of that friction. Now, telescopic forks these days generally are fantastic. They work really, really well. However, you do still need to keep working on them to make them work like that. This is a linkage fork, and it feels, uh, from what I felt actually on the message, feels like there's almost no stiction at all. Um, when you push down on the bars, they feel quite firm, but as soon as you push them into a curb, 
taking that onward hit that's where they come in and they just open up and they feel really quite different and uh, I'm quite excited about it actually. Um, the looks are definitely Marmite though, I think that's fair to say. I'd love to know what you honestly think of a fork like this. Bearing in mind that these guys are three industry suspension veterans, I'm gonna go and chat to them actually at Eurobike. Um, so as you're watching this show, I'm somewhere at Eurobike, hopefully slinging my leg over a pair of these forks to find out a bit more. But um, I'd love to know what you think of them. Just gotta bear in mind that it is a serious piece of tech. It's, I haven't just done this to look and be different. This has come from the great mind of Dave Weagle, who has come out with so many of the great suspension systems out there, like the classic DW Link that's used on so many bikes today. This is a serious fork. Um, yeah, so we'll come back to that one soon, but let us know in those comments and there's a few more great shots of it on screen now. Uh, next up in news is Nukeproof are back with another cool color range. Uh, they've been doing this quite a lot recently, so more uh, more recently, in fact, Sam Hill's bike and some of the other team runs at Elite Heap, they have the yellow bikes and having that purple anodized uh, Horizon range all over it, which I'm sold on it. I think that stuff looks amazing. But some riders obviously want to sort of dull things down a bit and go almost monotone. Uh, so they've had some Battleship grey bikes on the market and now they have the Horizon range in grey. Look at this. This looks really, really classy. So all the usual suspects in the range are there. Uh, there's the stem, which is available in 35mm, 50mm and 60mm in both 31.8 and 35mm uh, clamp diameters. There's the bar, there's three different heights in the bar. Uh, there's 12, 25 and 38mm risers, but just in the single 31.8, they don't make the oversized 35. Uh, there's obviously the pedals, there's the CL and CS clipless, there's a Horizon Pro and of course the Horizon composite body as well for um, the budget conscious and also for the uh, street riders and a lot of street riders like to run those composite pedals uh, sometimes they even remove the uh, screws so you can do grinds and stuff on them um, it's a really clean looking range uh, but nothing's actually new it's just a new range of color uh, but I like it and it's cool uh, next up something absolutely bonkers from Specialized and all right before you cut me off Yes, this is a road saddle at the moment, but you've just got to look at the way Specialized work to see where this is going to go next. Uh, what you're seeing on screen is their new saddle. This is a carbon saddle, and this is a 3D printed saddle. Um, so it has no padding, basically. It's got a lattice construction to the saddle, and they're actually using the actual material, um, basically, to give it flex and give it comfort, which, to be honest, I'm sold on already. I think this technology looks incredible. Um, have a look at it on screen now, it's absolutely bonkers. So they say it's grown using a digital light synthesis. Well, there's, there's a line I've never heard before in mountain, mountain biking, that's, a, that's certainly a marketable term. But it, more importantly, so, so it's a unique 3D lattice construction and there's 14,000 struts on every saddle. Um, basically the whole thing like, is quite forgiving. Uh, it just looks bonkers. Uh, I love the idea that they're toying with something that is nothing to do with traditional saddle design, i.e. rails that push into a base and then on there you have multi layers of different foam, densities of foam and then a cover. This is a completely new school of thought. And Specialized haven't come up with the body geometry concept many years ago uh, and many people swear by the saddles. I think they don't do things by halves and I would expect at some point this technology to make its way over to mountain biking. Although you clearly wouldn't really want a sort of open lattice design, it's gonna to have to have some sort of cover over that. But I think the technology looks insane. Really cool stuff and Specialized. Definitely looming on the horizon now, I think. Um, next up in news, this one is an interesting one. So I've seen a few prototype pictures floating around online and that and now there is a holding page up for a new bike brand called Privateer Bikes. Uh, this is it on the screen right now. Now the cool thing with Privateer is the person behind the brand. His name is Alistair Beckett. Um, some industry people would definitely know him because he was behind a lot of the more recent nukeproof stuff and in more recent times he's actually been working with Owen Pemberton on the Forbidden Bikes project. That's those high pivot bikes from Canada. Um, and what they're aiming to do basically is produce a really good value um, enduro specific style bikes. And some of the stuff that I've heard about these bikes, right, so four bar link, you can see that uh, in these images, 161 will travel, three sizes available or going to be available, um, between 470 and 515 reach, so nice and long, and that's also the same reach really as the uh, extra large in the Nuke Proof Mega, um, as is the chainstay, so they're 450 mil, so it's a nice roomy bike. 64 degree head angle, all looking really good. The cool thing that I've just spotted though is it's rumored to have an 80 degree seat angle on it. 
Why so steep, you might be wondering. Well, really, the steeper the better for a bike like this. It's the sort of bike you need to have a really efficient climbing position. And the steeper the seat angle is, when you're sat down grinding up those real steep climbs that you're gonna be smashing back down the other side of, you need a steep seat angle. Um, they've been creeping steeper and steeper in more recent years, but uh, having an 80 on there, if that's the case, wow, that's really, really cool. Um, I'm really looking forward to seeing some more images of these bikes and hopefully seeing some in the flesh soon, but just keep your eyes peeled for this bike brand because I think they're gonna be making some very cool stuff. <laughs> Okay, now it's time for Bike Cave. You know what a Bike Cave is? It's where you keep your bike. Um, it could be under the stairs, could be under your bed, it could be in your wardrobe, it could be in a purpose-built bike cave or even a shed. Uh, whatever it is, take some photos of your bike cave and tell us all about it. Tell us what you've got in here, what tools you've got, um, where you like to have that cheeky beer, while you're working on your bike, even what that cheeky beer might be. Anything at all to do with Bike Cave, send them in. The link to upload it is on the bottom of the screen right there and we love them. Uh, so first up this week is from Henry, uh, just says in his garage, and the bike in question here uh, is an Orbea Occam, that's a very nice bike actually. Hey Doddy, loving the show, recently built this little tall wall and I thought I'd send some pictures in. I'm only 14 years old and it's my first bike cave build, so I hope you like it. Well, so far you're doing pretty good, you've got a decent selection of tools, I see you've also got a bottle opener on there, what could you possibly be using that for at the age of 14? Bottles of coke I hope. Um, Pedal spanner, all sorts of decent stuff on the back there. So you've got your park tools, park toolbox. Hey, I tell you what, it's looking awesome. Very clean and tidy. Uh, you've got to have a nice clean place to work on a bike. You can't have it full of sawdust and stuff like that. Your tool board's looking good. I like what you've done with the Allen keys at the bottom. You've actually drilled holes so you can just sink them straight in. Um, I bet that's super easy to use. Yeah, that's looking very good. Um, how else are the rest of your tools held on? You haven't written that down there. It's hard to see, they've got some kind of invisible magnetic force holding them onto the board. I can see your adjustable span has got a couple of uh, pins at the top, but I can't see how your, uh, your wire wrench is on. I'm guessing it must be sat on a couple of pins on the wall there. I love the fact you've got the hook on the shelf above there. That's a really cool use of space, uh, keeping your bike vertically up and out of the way. Uh, yeah, looking really good. Thank you for sending that one in, Henry. Uh, looks like you've got a bright future of all of that stuff ahead of you there and a really nice bike to boot. Wish I had a bike like that when I was your age. I tell you, that is amazing. Uh, so next up is from Dave on the big island of Hawaii. Awesome. I'm not sure if you had one for Hawaii. I'm sure we've actually, we must have done by now. Uh, so you've got 2018 Yeti SB6 and 2015 Special Stump Jumper, repainted with loads of upgrades. Um, so I picked this up for a thousand bucks. It was in rough shape, did some bodywork, painted it inside and out. I love the fact this is our proper shipping container. That's what we're talking about, painting up. Uh, so a thousand bucks, I don't know if that's, um, doesn't sound like a lot of money for something that big. Um, I'm guessing that's pretty good. Notice the home-built bleed tank for bleeding shocks. Nice for the nitrogen bottle. Oh mate, you go the whole hog, don't you? This is awesome. Uh, one of your pictures got Fox 36 apart for grip to damper swap and low leg service. Nice. Oh yeah, there you go. You got your fill in your vac on there. Hey, that's really cool. I'd love to see a few more closer shots of that. That's a wicked setup. Uh, it looks like you've got some sort of uh, stethoscope type thing hanging up on the wall there. You a doctor of any kind? Doctor of bikes, maybe? Uh, loads of spare tires hanging up. Liking the tool chest set up there. Yeah, you can see your bearing drifts and all sorts of good stuff in there. I can tell you really like to get hands on with your maintenance. Looking good. Absolutely loaded in there, isn't it? Awesome. Cool, next up is from Marsan, uh, at home with my Canyon Neuron 2017. My bike cave is literally my flat. You can find bike tools and parts all over the place, which drives my wife a little insane. Uh, the more dangerous things are out of reach of our two-year-old daughter, but when she gets onto something, she's very eager to help fix and clean daddy's bike and her one too. The bike's hanging over our foldable couch, which is also our bed. Uh, on the opposite side, wow, so you've actually managed to score it so you can hang your bike over your bed, dude. That's so, I don't know how you get away with that. That's awesome. Uh, I don't race anymore. Uh, who knows, maybe one day I'll get back into it. Uh, we've also got a basement where I hold old bikes and there's more dirty parts like tires and cranks. I'll tell you what, you've done really well with the space there. Uh, it's always hard sort of juggling things around. Um, I'm permanently having to shift stuff around and um, to make the most of the space. So that's done really well. Uh, and I'm amazed you're allowed to hang that bike on the wall in, uh, in your front room there. It looks awesome. And thanks for watching Jim and Tech. I can see that on your TV on the wall there. And you've got a trail cat. I've just noticed you've got a trail cat. How did I not notice that underneath your TV? Rad. 
Okay, next up is from Joe in Norfolk in the UK. Uh, dude, what a setup you've got in there. That is uh, spanking new. Converted my workshop into a practical bike. Sorry, converted my garage into a practical bike workshop. I love working in there, uh, but it seems, as I did my old smaller workshop, I'm outgrowing it already. Considering a new house just for a larger garage. Don't tell the wife. Um, I think that's always the case, isn't it? If you've got some space, you spend it. It's like having cash in your pocket. I haven't actually got you end up spending it, didn't you? Uh, looks good. Looks like you've got a little a loft compartment up there. I like we you got your wheels up high and out of the way. Your bike's hanging up down the back. Massive tool board. Little parts trays. Hey, it looks good. Uh, there's plenty more room in there to put stuff in, I'll tell you that. Oh, and we've got one more as well. God, they've been flying in this week. So, one from uh, Tome uh, in Portugal. The old pipes and scraps room from my family was occupied by nonsense. Stubborn people didn't allow me to have it and clean my own weight until recently. Uh, moved out of the UK uh, and after studying industrial design in order to follow my dream of developing my own bike components brand um, I finally got my bike cave set up. I spent one month tuning it and here's my my initial shed Okay, all right, so you've got a nice little desk there looks like you've got a cutting board You've got a vice bolted straight to it priorities. I like it um, Hey, dude, it looks awesome. Look at that racking absolutely loaded with stuff in there So you've got loads of paint so you're clearly into your painting uh, you've got your muck off, your disc brake cleaner, full face helmet. Got a treasure trove of stuff hanging out in there. Hey, it looks awesome. Thank you for sending that one in. Some amazing bike cave entries this week. Thank you for sending them in and keep them coming. And now it's time for Rewind, which means talking about retro bikes, retro mountain bikes, old tech, how it translated to new tech any of that sort of stuff. If you've got anything old, uh, or if you want to know stories about where the new stuff came from, how those ideas came around, ask away in the comments, use the hashtag rewind, or better still, if you've got some photos or any video stuff you have, uh, send them in to us. Uh, the link is at the bottom of the page right there. So first up, already feel quite excited about this, uh, from Cologne, and this is a hot chili rampage. Man, hot chili bikes are like hen's teeth these days. You just do not see these things. Always remember their famous downhill bike back in the day, but I don't even know this bike. Um, this is awesome to see. It's not the best bike, but I love it and I ride it every day. Uh, can you tell me how old it is? Uh, handlebar stem, rear brake and pedals are not original. Um, it's hard to say. I mean, just looking at the rear shock, I'd, I would have guessed about 97. Um, and then the fork on there, so that looks like a Bomber Z2. Um, it's, it's got the two compression dials on the top. Um, both with the blue on there um, and that looks I think they were first released in 97 it's got the original arch on it a little bit different to the BAM arch that came a bit later um, I might be mistaken that but I'm pretty sure it's about, it must be about 97 um, but really cool to see it look at that it's got quite a low pivot I bet that pedaled pretty well actually I bet it still does pedal quite well um, but isn't it funny how bike geometry has changed so it's actually not that steep the bike but it's it's kind of looks uh, short short and high, um, bizarre looking thing. And then that direct route into the rear brake, which is a cable activated disc. And then the front one, so you've got a Brembo on there. Um, a right old mix of stuff, but really cool to see it. Cool, well thanks for sending that one in. Uh, next up is from this one's, wow, look at this. So this is a giant ATX 990. I had one of these looking exactly like this. Um, I'm fairly sure the original ones came with a blue rear end. Um, I Mine had a red, red rear end because I started with a 970 and I broke the front end and they allowed me to upgrade on warranty. I also noticed you've got the Gold Tech long travel plates on there which did give you more travel on the back. I think from four up to five and a half inches of travel it gave you um, but it raised your BB and your head angle at the same time. Original Bomber Z1s on the front of there with the uh, twin uh, disc mounts on there that fitted those Cullimore engineering dual disc brakes, a pair of Odyssey triple trap pedals, um, they looked lethal and they were lethal, they had no grip but they used to absolutely destroy your legs. I've got a massive scar on the front of my shin thanks to a pair of those. Um, I later traded mine in actually for a pair of Black Widows which were the lighter ones and even scarier. Um, but yeah, really, really cool. Uh, really nice to see that one, that one's for Dewey by the way. Um, yeah, good, good trip down memory lane. I'm pretty sure Chris Smith had one of these as well. What I found back in the day was um, I was in the era of jumping out of bomb holes to flat and um, the head tubes on these, they didn't have rings top and bottom so the Alcoa aluminium they were made from used to stretch 
they actually used to bell out. And I'm fairly sure I went for about six of those front triangles just from basically landing to flat. It wasn't any fault of the bike, it was basically just abuse um, for what you used to do back then. And the warranty guy, uh, Giant, back then, who incidentally I, I did meet later on down the line, he, uh, they kept changing the frame over through the local bike shop and eventually they got so annoyed of it, they gave us an ATX2 frame, which was the same as the one, it just had a cheaper shock on it. And they said, that, yeah, don't come back. Um, so it was quite good because um, I took that to recycle and I swapped it for a trials bike. So it came out that right with a Martin Ashton replica bike. So uh, cheers, Giant. Thank you. Uh, oh, look at this banger. This one's from, from Chris. Uh, my old downhill bike I used to race. Oh, look at that. M1 SL. Absolutely beautiful. So the Intense M1 SL, arguably, is probably one of the most copied um, downhill bikes of all time and this is one of the earlier ones that isn't even a horse link so this is a, a real nice rarity to see uh, it's like a fox vanilla shock on the rear there you know, piggyback you've got the enormous tioga saddle boxer 151s uh, hope four pots it looks like to me uh, mavic d 321s i think you've got 521s sort of ones with the rim surface on them these ones are disc brake only you've got those x light handlebars quite a lot of x light stuff on there actually e13 chain guide uh, XT rear derailleur um, and again it's got that uh, seat stay link so it's um, technically a faux bar uh, so a single pivot linkage activated back end but back then those things were so cool and I see you've got a Mr Dirt chain guide sticker on there so I'm guessing you had one of those at some point or perhaps even the Mr Dirt fork um, let's get on to the next one yeah there's a vanilla RC shock I still got my one somewhere actually um, quite a classic old shock I didn't realise the frame actually had chain tugs on it, kind of like you see on a BMX. That's quite cool, so you could adjust the wheelbase of it. Um, always thinking, Jeff Steve was. Oh man, look at the thing. And now you can see that um, sort of the linkage plate there, and it's got three positions for the shock and three positions for the actual linkage plate to go up and down as well. So you could change the way the back end felt, and you could also change the uh, geometry of it as well. Uh, yeah, there's another angle of those x light bars. Almost like um, a mini version of a four-piece BMX bar. Um, kind of cool at the time, but not that cool, I think. Uh, but that's the Steve Pete stem on there. I think it's got the little Steve Pete signature on it somewhere. Um, I've got one tucked away. Um, some Yeti ODI grips. Uh, what tyres you run on there? They've got Michelins, so they must be, what, Comp 16s or something? Or are they 32s? I can't quite see. They look like Comp 16s to me. Um, which were later known as DH16s, a fantastic tyre. Um, they're actually six pot brakes, they're not four pots. Wow, so you've gone the whole hog on there. Um, it looks mega. It's so nice to see this one, Chris. Really, really cool. Mr. Dirt USA. Hope stickers ride on. So it's a um, ride on bike shop, I think, up north. Mojo stickers on there. So you must have got your Mr. Dirt chain guide, I guess or Mr. Dirt Forks from Mojo in the era of uh, Chris Porter working over there because he used to run all that stuff as well. Oh man, really nice to see. It looks like you ran one of those massive filthy products fenders as well, judging by your top cap on there. So that, correct me if I'm wrong, but that was uh, the big sort of bung that goes all the way through and pulls your whole head tube together, um, your whole headset together, rather than having a star nut in there. Uh, a few people had different designs of those, but uh, super cool. And I've just noticed on that last shot, actually, your uh, handlebar width. 690 mil on a downhill bike. Crazy, isn't it? Now we're uh, over 100 mil wider than that now. But awesome. Thank you, Chris, for sending those in. Uh, really nice to see that bike, an old beauty. And now it's time for top mods. This is all about the modifications that you make to your bikes uh, to make them a little bit better. Um, it could be better just for yourself. It could be visually better to look better than your friends or a little bit different to ones you buy in the shops. Whatever they are, it doesn't matter. Send them in. We love seeing these modifications everyone makes on the bikes. It's even better if you do them yourself as well. So uh, feel free to uh, take some video footage of anything you do to your bikes or take some great photos and send them into our uploader service right there. Uh, first up is from Silvio in Germany and it's a Cannondale Super V 27 and a half. Oh, yeah, cool. Homage to the 1990s Cannondale Super V series, 2019 built and highly modified frame to fit 27 and a half inch wheels. Uh, one needs a complete Shimano uh, XT M8000 and the other one is a complete XTR M9100 build. Whoa, okay. So you've got a big 50 tooth cassette on the back, you've got the composite pedals. Uh, here we go there, so there's a fatty fork, the DOXT brake levers with the old three stroke on them. And then you've got your Super V style saddle there. 
Oh man, look at this thing. This thing looks cool. It's something about Cannondales. I don't know what it is. They've just made so many bizarre like frames over the years. I really like looking at Cannondale bikes. Man, so 2019 built and highly modified frame. How has this been possible? Look at this thing. And it's got the classic headshot fork. So headshot, in case you don't know about them, instead of having a telescopic fork with uh, telescopic twin legs, as you would see, what Cannondale did first was actually, they basically housed the shock mechanism inside the head tube and it moved on needle bearings, um, a big row of them. I think it was 88 bearings it had. Um, almost no friction, like they were amazing in use, but apparently a nightmare to service. Um, really cool concept though, and something very different. Um, as we later went on to know, the Cannondale did lots of things differently. They did their first twin crown fork, they did the lefty fork. Of course, now I've done the lefty single crown fork, they've done the Raven. They've made loads of cool and weird and quirky stuff. In fact, Cannondale's one of those brands, I really want to go and see them. I want to go and see all that obscure stuff that they've got tucked away, because I know that they've got a big vault of stuff there. But uh, there it is in all its glory, the Super V700. I think actually, um, after my initial patch where I saw that Mongoose amplifier that I really wanted from the beginning, the next full suspension bike I wanted was a Cannondale Super V. Um, I can't remember the model of it, but all the team riders at the time were using the bold red ones, and I'm pretty sure the one I wanted was a red one. Uh, it had a Fox Alps shock on the back. It was nowhere near as good as this. Uh, this is a much better bike with a lower main pivot. The old ones had quite a high forward pivot on them and a big sort of a traditional swing arm. Well, much more like an orange, actually, to be fair. Um, but this thing looks badass. Love it. Okay, next up is from Kerry in Brooklyn, New York. Ooh, that's a stinger. So the first picture is actually an x-ray. Um, hey guys, my name's Kerry and this is Lucille, my uh, uh, 2018 Canyon Spectral. I absolutely love this bike. I'm trying to take it everywhere I can. Since I first got the bike, many things have been upgraded or just replaced to make it my own machine. Uh, I upgraded my handlebars to a higher rise set with more width and comfort. Got a shorter race face stem because my arm's quite short and got some rev grips. A game changer hand pain. Um, sorry I didn't spend money on them sooner. Hey, that's really interesting. I'm glad. To, uh, I don't know many people that use them. Um, I've obviously have tried them out in the past. A really interesting concept. So that's really cool that you say that it definitely helped with hand pain. Um, so yeah, that's a good tip there from Kerry. For anyone else that suffers hand pain, worth worth checking out those rev grips. Um, what else have you done? So big 200mm rotors on the front and rear for the SRAM guide R brakes that came stock. Um, oh, actually, so you should change them now to SRAM code RSC brakes. Uh, that you found on the pros closet for a steal. Oh, I really need to go and visit the pros closet. That place sounds immense. I also added a wolf tooth morse cage bottle cage. Although the frame can fit a water bottle, doesn't mean it can fit a normal sized one. Uh, that's a good point. Yeah, so I guess a normal sized one for you would be a much bigger bottle than you're riding out there. Uh, and you've got a chain guide on there as well. I'll tell you what, the bottle looks really good. And I like the fact you've got a little tubalito tube as your spare tube. Um, I'm really pleased to see that because those things weigh absolutely nothing. I think they're immense. If I was going to carry a tube on the bike, that is what I would carry. You know, really, really good idea. Uh, you have done so much to this bike, it looks amazing. And unfortunately, though, you say I'm writing you this with a fractured fifth metacarpal, so I'm going to go in stir crazy, but watching your show keeps me sane, so thanks very much for that. Well, I really hope your hand heals up and you're able to go and enjoy your rev grips on your lovely Canyon Spectral again. Um, it looks awesome, I love what you've done to it. And it's really cool that you've done so much to it as well. That's the name of the game though, isn't it? Making a bike the best it can possibly be for you because we're all different. Uh, really cool. Thank you so much for sending those in, Kerry. That was wicked. And a few more detail shots there. Looking very nice. Oh, I just noticed, is that a king cage you've got in there? It looks like a king cage to me. Uh, it might not be, but I do like a king cage. Uh, just titanium bottle cage, quite classic. Uh, very cool. Very nice, thank you. Uh, some great entries into top mods there. Um, stepping up every week, people. We get some great ones, so keep them coming. Our tech of the week this week, I actually want to talk a little bit, just about locks, actually. Um, I've actually started researching locks a bit more heavily of late. Uh, did the feature fitting a ground anchor and also the security part one. I've just filmed the security part two. Um, and it's really made me look at locks and the way they work and the way people lock their bikes and that sort of stuff. Uh, and it's actually quite terrifying. I've been doing a bit of experimenting, just walking around the streets and seeing what locks people use on their bikes. And ironically, I've seen people with cheaper bikes with more expensive locks than the other way around, uh, which is really quite concerning. You really should be spending as much as you can afford on a decent quality lock. 
uh, from a reputable brand, you know, that could be someone like Kryptonite or Hiplock or Abbas in this case. Um, whatever you choose, make sure it suits where you're gonna use it and it's definitely gonna be strong enough for your knees. You really don't wanna be losing your bike. Now, I just wanted to show you this because in the next video that you're gonna see coming out, there's some questionable locks that I use in that video, uh, one in particular. I wanted to show you how advanced some modern locks are. Um, I don't think you're gonna get anyone picking a lock like this with a mechanism like that. So the guys from Abbas actually dropped a few locks around my house so I could use them in the video. And um, I actually borrowed this from them just so I could show you. Uh, it's absolutely fascinating how that works. And looking at what Abbas do for a living, making locks, they make some of the most secure locks on the market. And um, I'm hoping at some point I can go and visit them because I've heard they have got one of the best lock testing facilities in the world um, in their place. So they've got, they test everyone else's locks so they know where they are on the market. They test all of their own, they test them to destruction, they do atmosphere testing, salt testing for corrosion. They do the whole lot and all their locks apparently, you can pretty much leave them outside all year and they'll carry on functioning. Um, pretty good stuff. But seriously, um, get some decent locks on your bikes, lock them up, keep them safe. Don't let anyone take your pride and joy. And there we go, there's another weekly GMBN tech show in the bag. Uh, I'm actually at Eurobike right now. Um, I'm magically there, not here, uh, if that makes sense. So keep an eye out for some really cool content on our social feeds. And obviously there's gonna be loads of new tech coming up on the channel in the next few days. So make sure you check back constantly. Uh, when you subscribe, make sure you click that notification bell and you will see all of that new cool stuff in Eurobike that I'm gonna be posting on our channel. Uh, as always, give us a huge thumbs up and for a couple more videos, click down here. If you wanna cook along with Henry and do a home shock service, it's really cool if you make sure you've got all your ingredients and stuff and you can do it just like you do with the home cooking programs on TV. Uh, I think that's a great concept. And let him know in the comments if there's any other videos like that you wanna see him make. And click down here if you wanna see all about Tom Wheeler's bike. Uh, this is the adapted Mondraker, a fantastic piece of kit and what he's done to it in order to make it rideable is just astonishing. Make sure you check that one out. Cheers guys.